Can I have everybody's attention? I put my glasses on. Yeah. Uh, welcome and thank you for your interest in our first public meeting on uh, beer management. I'm Angelo Baiocchi and I'm here with uh, Barbara Martin and Patricia DeMarco. Uh, we're uh, several of your council members and we've organized this event. Uh, tonight we have with us uh, Chief Williams of our uh, police department, uh, along with uh, Brian Zoranik, uh, wildlife technician from the USDA Wildlife Services, and uh, Craig Hicks, also with the USDA Wildlife Services. Uh, they will be discussing some realistic measures that are available to manage our deer population. In the interest of time, uh, we will not have an interactive uh, question and answer session, but we'll address the questions some of you have submitted online. Uh, we also have some clipboards that I believe you've found. Uh, if you have any questions that you thought of when you walked in here, please write them down. And we'll, we'll try to answer those uh, as time permits. Uh, also keeping in mind that the Steelers are kicking off tonight at around 8.15, I believe. <laughs> but uh, we, we will stay here as long as uh, we need to. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Chief Williams. Thank you, Mr. Biden. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Can, we hear me. can you hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. Very good. All right. So basically, I'm in charge of this program that we have where we have people out there doing archery deer hunting during the hunting season. So I know there's a question I saw earlier today about how do you get to be on that list, let's say. And it's very easy to do, but the people I, I really am looking for are people that are experienced, that have done this before, people that maybe want to have their ability to use a tree stand to do this, because having an overview from the little higher level certainly protects us a little better when it comes to who's out there. Who's walking around, especially this time of year, where we still have a lot of weed coverage. So again, we're looking for people who are experienced. I know that you know everybody thinks this is like a product plug. It's not. Now I can't tell you that there's a fair amount of police officers who do this. There's a fair amount of public works people who do this. But there's also a group of residents that also do. This. Some of them are actually archery instructors, and they have some true experience and be part of people. But there are some regular people that have just been hunting for many years and have a lot of experience. And they go out there and they get on their tree stand. And throughout the last few years, we've had some, you know, some benefit from that, where some of the years have been gotten. Again, we we look for people to have experience. We want to have you know more buying from the public because you know we could always have a few more people. It's not like we, we let everybody out there want, because you do want to know when you're out there, who's out there, and where you're going to be. Again, we don't have a lot of area to it because it has to be on part of the property. Generally, we use two locations. One is behind this rec center over here, between the Western House and Avenue Park. That's one area where we have tree standing people, you know, if there are the bows and arrows up there taking out some of these overwhelming amount of deer to be out here, which I have to say we quite a bit. Another area is between Centurion Commons and the ballpark on Grass Road in the main park. We can do a little there because that's a safer area. We don't want to go too close to the ballpark because there's soccer there than some of you. We certainly don't want to go near the dog area. That's another bad spot to be. So we really want a few places to go, but we do want to control how many people are out there, who they are, and when they're out there. So that we don't have people, you know, too many people shooting arrows at the same time. Not a good thing. We don't have enough area. So again, to become a member of this, not so big club, you have to give me a call at the borough, and I will have a conversation with you and determine, you know, where you stand as far as your experience, and then you know we'll let you know how to go out and do this. And generally, a lot of it is just calling nine one one and letting us know when you should want to listen. You're going to be out here at this location from this time to this time, so that when we get calls from other people who may see you, we'll say, Yes, we're aware of it, and that's one of our people that we're So, again, this isn't difficult, 
And it, it certainly hasn't been beneficial. Because I can tell you, and I'm sure you probably know it yourself, but if you drive down Ardmore between October and January, you'll see us out there with our lights on, and maybe one of them laying the road, the car that's maybe been hit by the deer before the deer hit the car. And that's a common thing on here, especially during those critical times. I can tell you, our numbers are pretty high when it comes to Ardmore Boulevard and Marines Park Pike, the deer hits. It's a pretty high number. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Chief Williams. Uh, now I'll turn it over to uh, Ryan Sumani. Four years. All right, everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Brian Zacharinik, and I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Beside me is Craig Hicks. Um, within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, there's a small agency called Wildlife Services. And that's who we work for. Uh, we are a nonprofit, non-regulatory agency, so we don't write laws, enforce laws. We don't write permits or issue permits. However, we know a lot about the process as we've been doing it for you know upwards of 20 years and we work fairly closely with the game commission. So we have a good idea how the process all works. And we were asked today to just give everyone some information on what you can do, what you can't do, what might work and what might not work. Um, it's not my aim today to change anyone's opinion or even give my own just to give the information as was requested from us. So um, basically the Pennsylvania Game Commission exists to manage the wildlife in Pennsylvania and specifically they manage the deer herd. Um, it's up to them to issue any calling permits, not issue any calling permits. It's, it's completely up to them. And if you think about it, they also need to make hunters happy. So if hunters aren't happy, they will uh, not buy licenses. They will not buy tags. They won't contribute any money to the game commission, which means they don't have uh, income to increase enforcement or research or anything. So without happy hunters, the game commission will you know, lose its scope and lose its power. So I was asked to talk about how to obtain a deer culling permit if that's what the township was interested in. So the first thing you have to do is request a permit application from the game commission. They will send it to the township and then we'll have to work on filling it out. The first thing they're gonna want to know is uh, what is your archery program like or what is your hunting program like? And as Chief Williams said, he's been running it for multiple years. There's multiple hunters in it, which is more than enough to satisfy the archery requirement for the permit, I work with other townships who do less. They have less hunters and they they perfectly qualify for it. So the game commission wants hunters to have every available opportunity to take deer first. So as the season, the archery season ends, then you can bring in professionals or agencies such as ourselves to conduct the sharp shooting of deer. The last thing they want is for an outside agency or the police or whoever to just come in, shoot all the deer. Hunters will be mad and people will be upset as well. Uh, so for the permit application, you covered archery, covered hunting. The next thing you're gonna need is some sort of problem statement or metrics and goals. The problem statement's sort of gonna be why you want to pursue a calling permit. Um, and what goals you have for the program. So some townships, the goal will be less roadkill deer. Um, if some, if say you hit a hundred deer, maybe they could say our goal would be, we'd like to keep it under 50. Uh, and that would be your goal and that would be your metric to work towards. And then that can be measured that can be measured over the years as, you know, it's gradually coming down, so it's working or it's not coming down, it's not working. Other places like city parks and county parks, their metrics will be different. And yours may be partly this as well, where their, their goal will be to have a more healthy forest canopy or more healthy forest. So as you have too many deer, they eat everything that grows. So. And you eventually you end up with only old growth forests, which sounds nice, but nothing new grows. So as those trees grow older and they die off and 
fall down and nothing's available to replace them. The only thing that grows would be things that the deer won't eat, like multiple rows and, you know, things that aren't really, uh, not, nobody would really want those in the forest. So uh, one of the metrics they would use is how do we measure forest growth? And a lot of those places will build enclosures to keep deer out and they will measure what grows inside that versus what grows outside that. And if, you know, the, the things inside the fence will grow, you know, a foot a year and the stuff outside grows zero, then you can kind of measure that over time and see what what grows, what doesn't grow. And that can be your metric for success as long as you're having growth. I don't know uh, what exactly your metric would be. I don't know what your your council exactly wants. Uh, those are just a couple different things you can use. So we have our archery hunting program. We have a problem statement and goals. We have a way to measure progress. And if it's road kills, it's just, did we pick up less this year than last year versus the previous year versus the previous year? And if I, I'm not sure who picks them up for you all, but if your if your public works picks them up, all they have to do is make a note, keep it in an Excel file, and then send it off at the end of the year, and you can you can track that. So we have that. We're going to send in the permit to the game commission. If it's good, if they have no problems with it, they will send you an amount of deer tags. Um, that's your allotment of deer that you're allowed to kill for the year. Uh, with those tags come stipulations, such as the time of year that you can shoot. And normally that's going to be the end of the late archery season, which is going to put you around February through the beginning to mid-April. Um, you can't shoot before or outside of those times unless it's uh, marked on your permit. It will also say on your permit, every deer that is killed has to be donated for human consumption. So every deer that gets shot has to be gutted, taken to a, a processor. Those are butchered and donated to Allegheny County Food Banks, Westmoreland County Food Banks, and different food pantries. So that'll say one of the line items on there, that everything has to be donated. Okay, so we have all that. We have our permit. Say you hire somebody to come in and shoot deer. So how is that done? Um, a typical culling program is going to start around the beginning of February. It'll last for a couple months. Um, we will come out, we'll look at spots that people have um, offered up their land for. I know one of the questions, and I'll, I'll cover it now, but I'll cover it again when I get there. Somebody said, I don't want anybody on my property. How do I keep people off my property? If you don't sign up for the program, you're not in the program. So if if I have a great backyard that I want people to come shoot in and I sign up for it, great, we'll come look at your property. If you absolutely don't want anyone on yours, we won't come to it. It's not a countywide, or it's not a township wide shoot every deer you see. It doesn't work like that. You have to sign up for it. Um, then after we have our properties that we think might work, we come out and we put out bait. Um, I know the idea of baiting to a lot of people is inhumane or not fair. And if this was a hunting program, I would absolutely agree. It violates the idea of fair chase. It gives you another unfair advantage over deer. Um, you pull them into certain areas that they normally wouldn't be in. And if you're hunting, it's not fair. But the way to look at a calling program is this is not hunting. This is the controlled removal of deer in the most efficient and safe way possible. And the use of bait eliminates variables. So if I were to come out and look at your property and I were to decide it would work for us, I would bait a certain area and then I would be able to scout, make sure everything looks good. There's no obstructions, there's no hazards. That way, if I show up at a house at two in the morning and there's a deer standing on a bait pile. I know what's behind it to the left of it and to the right of it. And I know that's a safe shot to take the second I get there. Um, I also need to know what the backstop is. Shooting into an earthen backstop or a dirt backstop is 100% necessary. If it's a rocky backstop and a bullet passes through a deer or a shooter misses a deer, um, rocks can definitely cause ricochet, dirt can't. Uh, that said, we do use fragmenting ammunition. So 
that comes apart as soon as it hits anything. However, it's a man-made bullet. Sometimes it passes through deer. Sometimes shooters miss a deer. If anybody were to ever tell you that they never miss anything, they would be lying. And I've been doing this for, for 20 years and I've never seen anybody not miss something. You're using a man-made rifle with a man-made bullet, shooting at a deer that's living and twitching. And sometimes they move just as you're about to shoot. And sometimes people miss. It's it's 100%. I would never deny that that happens. Um, okay, so now we have the area scouted. One important thing to say is uh, culling programs don't abide by hunting laws, obviously. If we're baiting, we also don't have to abide by 150-yard safety zone. So if you were to take your rifle out into the woods and hunt deer, you have to be 150 yards from any occupied structure to be legal. This is not hunting. Again, it's the controlled removal of white tailed deer. So as long as we have the property owner's permission, we can shoot deer on that property. So basically we, we show up to a spot, we shoot a deer, we load it in the back of our vehicle. At the end of the night, everything goes to a, a meat processor. They process it, it gets donated to the food banks. At the end of the project, he'll give me a total of how many pounds of venison we've donated and where it went. And then if we have a, a final report or anything like that, it would be in there and it would say you donated, you know, 5,000 pounds of venison to various food banks. So that's a calling program. Um, I'm going to cover a couple other things that I know are going to come up. So deer contraceptives, birth control, immunocontraceptives. Uh, two popular ones are Gonicon and PZP. Gonicon was actually developed by my agency, the USDA, for use on white-tailed deer. However, the, the be-all, end-all of this discussion is no immunocontraceptives are approved for use in Pennsylvania. It doesn't matter how you feel about them. You can think they're the best thing in the world. They're not approved for use in Pennsylvania. So will they eventually be? I don't know. If they are, would we be willing to use them? Sure. It's another, uh, as Craig said, it's another tool in the toolbox. You can absolutely use them, um, but they haven't gone through the regulatory process. So they're not approved. They're not legal. Um, how about uh, trap and relocate? That's another thing that I've seen come up a lot. Why can't we catch a deer in one spot and move it to Crawford County where they're they're low on deer population. The main reason for that is disease concerns. There's a lot of diseases in white-tailed deer. Mainly the hot button one right now is chronic wastings disease or CWD. And the problem with this is, as far as we know, it's not in Allegheny County right now. However, it, it could arrive tomorrow and no one would ever know until deer started turning up with it. So there's no way to test a live deer to see if it has this. The only way to test is to dissect a piece of a, a deceased deer's brain. So say you catch 10 deer and we decide to move them to you know, Crawford County where they don't have a lot of deer. So you take your 10 deer, you move them from one spot to another where they didn't have a disease and you basically just moved a disease from one spot to the other. And now that can, it can grow and proliferate in another area. So it's the same thing with rabies. You can't catch a, a groundhog in your backyard and drive it 100 miles and drop it away. A raccoon, I should have said, you can't catch a, any rabies vector species and move it uh, because you could just move rabies from one spot to another the same way you can move CWD from one spot to another. So the game commission is never, ever going to give a permit for trap and relocate. Um, so even if the immuno immunocontraceptives were a be all end all and they were perfect. I think there's been different studies that have come out and I'm, I'm sure people could find them. I think one was by Cornell uh, a few years ago that basically said, we tried to control a population with just contraceptives and we couldn't do it. So even some of the islands where you see people do this, um, they've supplemented it with sharpshooting to lower a population before they can do it. But again, contraceptives are not approved in Pennsylvania. I just, and I just confirmed this with the Game Commission's deer biologist last week to make sure I didn't say anything that wasn't true. It's a, it might happen in the future, but as of right now, it's, it's just not a possibility. So that's all I had for the uh, culling um, and the two things that I think might come up. Um, would you like me to go through questions or would you like that 
Do you want to ask anything specific well, that I may have missed? Yeah, uh, could you uh, just uh, mention the costs that would be involved in, in doing that? Uh, sure. So I can't I can't talk about contraceptive costs. Um, I can't talk about trap and relocate. I guess the other thing that I did, I failed to mention was the the idea of capture and um, surgically sterilize. And I don't know that that's ever been done in Pennsylvania. You could potentially try to get a permit to do that, but you're looking at costs that are multiple multiple times higher than a sharp shooting program. You'd have to you have to catch a deer, anesthetize it, have veterinarians on site to do surgeries, and then release those deer. And so let's say you catch every doe in the township, which you never will. Um, you surgically sterilize them and you release them. If those deer don't get hit by cars or killed by a hunter, they could live 10 years. So really you're not gonna see any kind of population reduction for 10 years, assuming it worked and assuming it was a closed population. It's an open population, so they just come and go. Um, I don't know that it would ever work. And again, being open, I can't imagine it would. So as far as costs go, it, it's hard for me. I can't give you a quote on a, a calling program. It depends a lot on what you would like us to do. So say you want us to, from the, we step in and we write your permit for you, we send it to the game, game commission, we do your mapping, we visit all the sites, we buy your bait, we do all the shooting. That, that's one way to do it. The other way is you can all do your mapping on your own. Um, you can do your permit on your own. And all, all these things are gonna save money. The other thing is I don't know how many deer you would all wanna shoot. Um, I, I don't know your population. So you figure deer processing has gone from $80 a deer to $120, $130 a deer in the last three years. So every deer you shoot costs exponentially more to have processed. And that's something you have to do. You have to process those deer and donate them. Um, so again, if you want to shoot 30 deer versus 100 deer, you're talking many, many thousands of dollars of a, a different price. Um, Historically, for us to to run a program, if you were divided to divide it out from the beginning to the end, you're looking at somewhere in the ballpark of three to four hundred dollars per deer shot. That's not if I shoot a deer, you write me a check for three hundred dollars. That's the average of the project divided out from beginning to end. And we don't do cost per deer because the the thought has always been. If I'm getting paid every time I shoot a deer, there's going to be a certain incentive to shoot more deer. So maybe a shot's not perfect. Maybe I'm not comfortable with something. But if I just keep thinking $400, $400 every time I shoot, it, it's just not the way we do things. Some people might, but we don't. Um, and then there's the cost of we need to bait for basically two months. So if you have township employees that could bait for us, that's it, that are already being paid by the township, they are already receiving an income. They can go out and do this. It saves us multiple hours per day, which by the end of a, a end of a contract, you're looking at you know dozens and dozens of hours that again would be billed to you from us. So that's another cost that a, all all these things are variables that I can't really pin down. But historically, for a project like this, and this is a very wide ballpark, and I would not be held to it until I sat down and I wrote all these things out, you're somewhere in a very wide ballpark of thirty to fifty thousand. And it's there's there's variables and like how many places can we shoot? How many how much public access do we have? How many private property owners have signed up to let us shoot on their property? If it's a lot of people, and we have a lot more opportunity to shoot and take deer it gets done a lot easier. Um, if there's not a lot of places, it's much harder to do. And this is a, it helps if the community or the people that actually want to do it, sign up. Um, if not, we're stuck on township parks and properties and things like that. And it's, it's very much harder without public input. So um, Estimated cost, question. What else would you like me to answer that you could? Um, I, I think that's all for okay. what I had, but uh, anyone else? 
or have we answered the question? No, there's still okay. questions. Does anybody have a question on the Twitter board? Uh, I'll be happy to take well, that. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be back. I just want to add that, uh, you know, what Brian's yeah, getting. Oh, no, I, you don't have to press it. I don't have to press it. <laughs> yeah. it's still important here. Um, so just to add, you know, Brian's been giving you hypotheticals if we were to do it. But, you know, as he mentioned earlier, there's other companies out there that can do this. You know, when he's speaking about the experiences that he's had and how we set these things up, this isn't saying we're doing it here. This is just saying how we would go about doing it here, do it if we were to do it here. But, uh, you know, some of these private entities out there would do things a little differently. We can't speak for them. But also, just a little bit of a thought. Brian mentioned forest health being a, a metric on the way some of the parks are viewing things. And I think it's important, if you've ever seen that web of life, where you throw yarn around a room and everybody tugs at it, and if you take this animal out of the equation, the net or the web goes loose. It, you know, everything's connected. But it's important to realize that that web is very delicate and when you have a high deer population it's going to pull on that web and so when we think about arbor vitae our shrubs our trees things like that we need to think bigger picture about how that impacts songbirds that nest in that early successional growth as well so when you end up with the old growth forest as brian said think of how many species of birds and other wildlife are going to suffer from that change in the habitat and then the last thought i had i know one little rants here but um, you know, the whole idea of trap and relocate, think of it this way, many of us are accustomed to our suburban living here, and if I picked you up and dropped you in the middle of Potter County, not knowing anybody, how long would you make it? And so some of these deer with that trap and relocate, even if it were an option, just aren't going to make it because it is so different for them. Many of them would die very quickly after being released. And I did skip over that. There's There's a condition called capture myopathy or trap myopathy where a certain amount of deer that are caught will just die in the trap. Um, if you think the high heartbeat animals, you know, white-tailed deer and, and squirrels and rabbits, um, they get so stressed out that a lot of them are just going to die. And you can find research on this that's going to vary from, you know, 15% to 40% to will just in, in, immediately die in a trap. And that can be changed by the capture type, whether it's a drop net, a clover trap, rocket net, uh, the more invasive the trap, the more stressed out they get and the more they will die. And if you move them to another area at another 20% on that are just going to die as soon as you move them, like, they'll, they'll die within the first year. And that's all available research. Um, but again, the game commission is just not going to do it because of the disease concerns. You have some of the questions that were previously yes, submitted that um, we could take a look at. All right. Do you plan to kill the deer other than the bow program? I hope not. I don't plan to do anything. I was just asked here as a informational meeting. Um, it's up to your elected officials to decide if they want to do this or not. And it really is their decision as they see based on the township's concerns. Um, how many citizens have been approved to hunt in the borough parks compared to police officers? Perception is that this is a limited access opportunity. I think I addressed that earlier in my conversation. That it's not a private club. You just need to call us and let us know if you want to be a part of it. And again, I, I'm looking for people who do have some training, some maybe years of practice with this, and they're probably willing to do it with the tree stand. Because again, we're trying to look at this as the safest way we do it. And this time of year, with all this, you know, coverage from these trees and these bushes, st staying up in the air doesn't help because you're overusing the area you're trying to shoot. And shooting downward makes the air probably going. It's in a direction where we're probably going to go into the ground at some point in time, flying across, you know, top bar. So it's really a safety issue in my mind. But again, we don't have a huge area and we are a populated community. So again, the safety part for me is the most important. Okay. Can the borough limit or stop movement by installing deer fence in areas that have severe population and or known crossings? 
Um, I would answer this by saying I've personally seen deer jump an eight foot fence. Uh, you pressure a deer, it'll jump a 10 foot fence. So unless you want to surround certain areas with, you know, 12 foot tall fence, I, I can't see how installing fence is gonna, is gonna work unless, you know, unless you do want the eyesore of the fence. But again, that's, that's not up to me. All right. Why should I continue to spend considerable time and money on supposedly deer resistant plants and shrubs to beautify my property when the deer consistently eat them like it's a salad bar at Eaton Park? <laughs> I have used every deer repellent method known to humankind to no avail. I have had to erect fencing material around large shrubs and planting beds or place plastic mesh domes over individual plants to discourage deer from grazing. Now I can't even enjoy my view of my own garden beds through all the fencing and domes. When we moved to Forest Hills over 30 years ago, the deer population was not this large. I know the adjacent communities like Churchill have the same issue. Would it make sense to form a consortium with those other communities to humanely reduce deer population? So I can't tell you what you should and shouldn't do with your plants. Um, if you wanna keep trying, more power to you. Uh, deer will eat everything. Uh, I've seen them eat holly in the, in the rough winters. Um, they make deer sprays that some people swear by, but also another group will tell you they don't work at all. It, it's completely up to you if you want to keep trying to plant things or not. Um, so in here it says Churchill. Uh, Churchill shoots deer. They've shot deer. They've done deer calling for years and years now. Um, many people might not know about it because when programs are new, everybody does as they move on and there's no issues and no safety concerns, no problems, you tend to stop hearing about them. So being that you have a neighbor that you border that, that does deer calling already will only help your township should you decide to do that. As for forming a consortium, you're starting to see a lot more townships in Allegheny County do this. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen on the news that the city of Pittsburgh and the, and the city parks is starting an archery program. That probably is not going to go away. And again, the more people that, that remove deer, the, the lower the population should be for everyone. Do you have any statistics about whether the incidence of Lyme disease among Forest Hills residents has increased along with the size of the deer population in the borough? That sounds like a very specific question to Forest Hills that I don't imagine you have the answer to. I don't even know how you would find that. That would all have to be... I mean, I'm not sure you might have to go to the Department of Health or something like that, but I, I wouldn't have any information like that and I wouldn't even know where to find it. What can we do specifically? Right. Yeah, there, there have been studies in uh, New Hampshire, I believe, or maybe Connecticut, where they had found increased incidence of Lyme with high deer densities in those communities. And I don't know the study off the top of my head, but. Um, so it might exist. Yeah. You just have to find it. Okay. Um, what can we do specifically at our homes to discourage the deer from eating the vegetation and sleeping in our yards, et cetera? Again, not much. There, there's so many deer that they don't have anything to eat. They're going to eat everything they can find. Um, they're going to sleep where they want to sleep. You can encourage them gently to leave your yards, but there's really not a lot you can do. Um, no particular question, but I want to hear something on how the deer population will be reduced as they're quite destructive and pose health risks. So I feel like we've already covered most of this. You have an established archery program. Should your township decide to enact a deer culling program via sharpshooting, that would be your other option. Um, I do not want any hunters on my property. Will hunters respect private property? Also, what steps will hunters take to make sure no pets and children are harmed? What hours and days will be hunting? Will hunting be allowed? So I can answer this in a couple of ways. The first would be um, no one will come on your property if you have not signed up to be in any kind of a program. You've had an archery program for years. As far as I know, you haven't had any accidents or incidents. Um, as far as what hours and days will hunting be allowed? Hunting is allowed by the Pennsylvania Game Commission through the entire hunting season. So we live in management unit 2B. 
archery season started on the 16th of September. It's going to run through late November and then come back in sometime later in November and run through um, the end of January. So that's not typically limited. That's that's just the dates that are allowed by the game commission. Should you enact a culling program? Again, the game commission is going to give stipulations on what dates you can and can't shoot. Typically, those are going to be February, March, April. Uh, hours that that'll be done varies by area, but it's typically 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, it's in the winter. It's cold. Not as many people are out. It's dark. People should be asleep. And, but if you would want to tighten that down, change your hours, it's perfectly fine. It, it's just who, whoever makes the program is who decides those hours. Um, what steps would we have to make sure no children are harmed in pets? Um, again, the archery program is an archery program. Um, I'm not aware of any child or pet ever being harmed in an archery program. I could be wrong, but I think it's statistics would show that the, the only injuries that really happen in archery season are archers injuring themselves. Sure. Um, they're basically holding a razor blade on the end of an arrow. It's not terribly uncommon for one to make a mistake and cut their finger or, you know, things like that. Incidents where other people have been injured is often two people hunting together. One's walking in front of the other one. One has an arrow knocked and they, they run into their buddy. I mean, it's people don't get shot with, with bows and arrows. It just doesn't happen. As far as the sharpshooting, I mean, we've, we've done this around many townships and parks and many different places for over 20 years. We've never had an accident or an incident. Um, I would have to, I don't know how to look up what other people have had, but as far as I know, I've never heard of a, a problem where a pet or a person or even property has been injured. It's such a precise activity that Th those incidents are very few and far between, if at all, and I don't know of any. Deer wild animals, they are not pets. They carry ticks that transmit Lyme disease to humans and distribute them in our yards. Two of my friends have had their professional lives severely damaged after Lyme infection. Feeding the deer corn, putting out salt blocks, should be a citable code violation. Yes, it is. Okay, so you guys all have a you have a no feeding policy already, right? And if any, right, and if anyone is aware of someone doing that, uh, please call our code enforcement officer and let them know. Okay. No question. I just want to state on the record that I'm in favor of calling. I see deer nearly every day in my yard neighborhood, and understand that our region is overpopulated. Ooh. I've seen many dead deer on heavily traveled roads and have also heard frequent complaints from neighbors about deer destroying their gardens and posing traffic hazards. One of my neighbors contracted a serious case of Lyme disease requiring hospitalization a few summers ago due to the pro pro proliferation of deer in her yard. Therefore, I support any well-planned approaches to reducing deer population in forest hills, including sharpshooters and archers, so long as public safety measures are in place. Also, please, please, please do whatever you can to discourage residents from feeding deer. Post signs, make illegal, issue citations, fines, whatever. People who feed them often have good intentions, but don't realize they're only making a bad situation worse. So I believe we've covered all those. No feeding is one of your policies. Um, again, there wasn't really a question, so I don't know how to say it. Okay, this one says, more of a request than a question. If possible, please provide information about deer contraceptives. A lot of people on Nextdoor and other social media forums have asked about this as an alternative to calling. My understanding is that they're expensive, time-consuming to administer. Do you have to be sedated and injected or surgically sterilized? and are really not effective until optimal herd size has been achieved. Personally, I think calling is the most efficient, humane, and cost-effective option at this point. Plus, meat can be donated to the food bank. But a lot of people don't like the idea of hunting in their town. Thank you. Um, you cover the contraceptive thing. It's not legal in Pennsylvania. Surgical sterilization might be possible should the Game Commission grant a permit for it. However, it is extremely, extremely expensive and... Um, 
most studies will show that it's ineffective in a wild population. The last one says trapping deer drop net, trapping deer with clover traps, rocket trapping deer capture net. So that's not really a question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that the idea is they want to look at different methods of trapping and either relocating or euthanizing deer. Um, you can't trap and relocate. It's not gonna happen. Uh, trap and euthanize can potentially happen. However, it is more time consuming. It's more costly. It causes more stress on the deer. Um, it's, it's harder to do. And if, if you're looking at the stress factors of a, a deer being captured in a net and then euthanized, it's, they're far higher than uh, a, a sharp shooting program as far as stress goes. Thank you. Sure. Um, now we have yeah, there's some other questions. Then. Yeah. I'm gonna, I hope the person who wrote, wrote this was in here and I apologize. The $300 cost per deer, all. Any idea? All inclusive costs. Oh, there you go. All inclusive co costs. It's, it's not really, it's not $300 per deer. It's, it's, if you write a contract, is that yours? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you write a contract to, to remove deer and you have a final price, I'm just dividing how many deer we typically take by that cost. And that's how we're coming up with three to $400 per deer. However, that can vary. And if we were to give an estimate, which we've not been asked to do, and I'm not trying to talk anyone into, uh, we write what we're called um, not to exceed estimates. So say we quoted you at $40,000, it, it can't go over that. It's, oh, can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me just start over with that one then. I apologize. So it said, um, is the $300 per deer uh, all inclusive? And again, it's it's not a it's not a cost per deer. It's basically the the cost of a contract total cost divided by how many deer we typically take, and then um, it's basically averaged out to three to four hundred historically. However, those those prices or just an estimate and just a guess. Yes, sir. So I understand what you're saying, but is that if you do everything that's the cost or if the borough does some things that that cost goes down? Sure. So so say I I I wrote in a cost for we will do everything from start to finish. Um it will obviously be higher than if I were to say you guys do everything and just have an outside company come in and shoot deer. It's obviously going to be lower by the amount that we do. So if we do less work, it's going to cost less. If the if the township does a lot of the work on their own. It's... So the question is for, for Jess, was that for everything or was that for the borough business? Uh, well, it's it's still going to be three to four hundred dollars ish per deer. Um, you could just average it out lower. Say if you wrote a twenty thousand dollar estimate and you shot you know, X amount of deer, it's still going to average out to the same. Or if you wrote a higher estimate, it would probably end up being a little less, as you said, you probably not quite as many deer per dollar because you do have all the legwork of the debating and the permit rating and all that stuff. So you you probably take a little less deer per, you know, per the contract. So that three to 400 would probably go up a little bit, but it really just depends on how much work the, the township employees would do, um, how much work we would be asked to do. So you know, the more we do, probably the the few less that you get for for contract. So that probably would go up a little bit. Okay. Go ahead. I'm still not given a figure. Me, I'm just ballparking. Let me just I, I think I'm I got trying that. to get through these questions first. If we have time, you, then you can ask some follow up questions. Did you have a way to answer that? I'm missing. The figure that you came up with for that was that based on some of our existing work where we do all the work. Or was that yes, okay. that, that would be a good way to do that. Historically, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. That I, I'm sorry that I tripped over that. Um, if a deer ends up in our yard, will the borough remove the deer? I see them on the side of the road not being removed. If a deer is wounded seriously, will the policeman be able to put them out of their misery? Um, I'll answer quickly and then I'll defer this. Um, 
sharpshooting is, is not typically an issue. Uh, you shoot a deer and it falls down and then we pick it up. However, archery programs, deer can all, always run when they're struck with an arrow. Hunters make every available attempt to retrieve their deer. And I would imagine if they end up on someone's property, then the next thing we do is talk to the police. And then we, would that be about right? You escort yes. them on, they get the deer and- That's exactly. Okay. Um, are the deer sent to food banks? Um, yeah, we already talked about that. That goes through, that's a stipulation in the permit you would receive from the game commission. So everything has to be donated. Size of property needed to allow shooting on. Um, we shoot deer on third of an acre property all the time. Uh, if you have a good backstop and you have a good place to shoot deer, it can be a very small place. If you're talking archery hunting, you need a much, much bigger property. Uh, do we pay the cost of processing? Yes, that is added into the estimate that we would, or someone would give you. Um, that's all taken care of. When culling is done once, do you see a noticeable reduction in the population, or do you have to continue this practice for several several years um, toward maintaining a low population? So good question, and absolutely. So a good way to think of this is it's like snow removal, cutting grass, or road maintenance. If you stop doing it, your problem's going to come back. Um, if you do an initial calling and you're very successful and you take a lot of deer, you probably will see a reduction in your next year. Your, your road kill numbers should come down provided you shoot enough deer. <clears throat> but again, I don't know how many deer you have. I don't know how many you would have to take. But I can, I can speak for one of the places where we've, we've always worked. Um, they had 200 deer killed on the roads per year. We shot for two years, uh, their number dropped below 100. And it's, we've been there since. It stayed below 75 for 14 years. So there is an ebb and flow of population uh, as we have less harsh winters, we have more deer. But if you if you do culling, you, you should probably see a drop pretty immediately in your problem. However, you do have to keep doing it. As soon as you stop, your population goes right back up. It would be helpful to publish in the Tree City Times, maybe. Oh, okay. What's it called? Tree City Times? Yeah. Uh, it would be helpful to publish more in the Tree City Times, more information about the archery program. Very few citizens are aware, but would be interested and have the expertise. Um, Chief's already talked about it. Uh, I don't know how your, your publishing goes, but we can do that. Publish it and get the word out. Citizens. Yeah. Okay. We own maybe three acres. I'm sorry if I can't read that. Yeah. Three acres of land in the borough, including a tree stand. Can we legally hunt deer on our property with a bow if we have state licenses? Offline answer is fine. Phone number provided. Um, does your you don't have any ordinances against? Shooting, hunting, projectiles, firing a weapon, firing. Okay. Okay. So as long as you're following the game laws, yeah. Okay. As long as you're following game laws, you're perfectly fine. And you have to be 50 yards from a occupied structure unless you have permission. So if you were 50 yards less than that from your house and you give yourself permission, you're also fine. Would it make sense? Would it make more sense to hunt call bucks before rutting season in the fall rather than bucks and does in the spring? Taking out the bucks would help control population growth. So it's actually a common misconception. The best way to reduce deer population is to reduce doe. So if you have one buck and you just left one buck alive, it can breed every doe that it comes across. And each one of those deer is going to have, you know, between one and two, very occasionally three fawns. Um, every adult doe that's taken out of the population, that's that doe and two fawns that can't show up next year. You would really have to take out a um, ridiculous amount of only bucks and you still wouldn't see the same population drop. 
on top of that, um, I don't imagine the game commission would be particularly happy if the township is only shooting bucks. And again, it, it won't produce the same effect. Now, my uh, schooling was a long, long time ago in this, but I remember back in the 90s, the research that was available at the time suggested that you could remove 93% of the buck population and it will still grow. Now, there's been a lot more research since then, but I would imagine that it still holds pretty true that you can take 90% of the buck population and it will still grow. So as Brian said, that one buck will do his work happily and run all over the township <laughs> with a smile on his face. Um, what do you get by the car? How will compliance be handled if an ordinance is enacted? Um, I don't. I think that's talking about the feeding. Yeah, that's is that's it, your no feeding. If it's for the feeding, again, if it's about feeding. Um, if you're aware of someone feeding deer, leaving salt lakes out, um, you need to call the code enforcement officer to let them know. Okay. Will the pathways between the streets be protected from hunting, or would people want to avoid those paths? Pathways are normally closed in icy conditions but asking if weather is warm. So for your archery program, I don't know what your pathways are, but I imagine you're, you're probably not hunting those. Yeah. Um, as far as winter shooting, if it's township property and it's good property to shoot on, I would imagine you would be shooting on that property. Yeah. However, there's no reason to avoid the areas. It, you know, again, it's done at night when, when probably no one is out. And even if it were, or even if people were out, we, we and everyone else uses thermal imaging to locate deer, look for people. Um, so you would definitely see those people before any shooting would be done. Uh, how and where did residents have the opportunity to answer the survey? Uh, the, the, uh, the survey was conducted uh, October of 2022. And uh, it was published in the, uh, in the borough website. And uh, that's, that, that's the only survey that we've conducted thus far. And it was, yeah, it was also noted on Saturday Citizen as well. That was all the okay. submitted questions? Yeah. Um, at the risk of uh, causing a riot, um, does anyone else have any questions? Follow up questions that they would like to ask. I have seven years to read on this, and what I've read is it's really the big one, the issue. So if it's a budget group, so the survey report, so mm -hmm. then the viewer are going to come here and then you know, recall our population. And I've also read that once a population is added, as my colleague, once it's government, it's um, reproduction can take place. No, I, I know you can successfully do it year after year and have work, but so so you're saying, I know what you're saying about the population. Saying, I mean, uh, I, I've heard that about coyotes, where if you eliminate their population, their next breeding cycle, um, they tend to try to have more pups. Yeah, I I haven't heard it about deer, and if okay. you'd like to send it off, I'd be happy to read it. Um, but you said that the food source brings them in, which there's always going to be a food source exactly. as long as you have right and you and realistically those other areas probably also have food sources what they're going to do is as you remove deer they will move into open spaces that aren't contested by other deer however like i said you know at least on one side you have churchill so they're not coming from churchill um and the best thing you can do is eliminate as many as you can if, if that's what they decide to do i i don't know but um I can't say that they won't come in because they will, but the idea is you will have less and less over time. Okay. So even if they do come in some, you won't have as many come in. And I can, I can just say anecdotally from all the projects that we've done, there will always be deer. They will, they do not go away, but we can look at our metrics of success being road kills and those numbers always go down. That's, that's the best way I can answer that. So in order to have a legal hunting program in your backyard, if you have sufficient 
criteria that make that happen. There has to be a borough ordinance to support that. It has to be borough wide. When you say legal hunting program, do you mean yeah. hunting? Or do you mean yeah. sharpshooting? Yeah. You're, you're, if, if you were to do all the work, you, you would do that. You check everything out. Yeah. So if if I were if you wanted someone to shoot deer in your yard, um, it would have to be a borough wide program. Um, I'm not aware of the game commission allowing anyone to just have deer shot in their backyard because they don't want them there. Um, it might be a thing, but as far as I know, I've never heard of it. And I don't. Have you ever heard of that? No. Okay. No, I mean I, th I think and, at the end of the day, that decision is if it came down to the borough would like to have. A you know a, a deer removal program, then we would need to work with people such as yourselves that allowed that access to the property. And if you said I don't want you on our property, then we can't come on your property. Nobody can forcefully come on your property. It would all be voluntary by the citizens. Back there. So thank you for doing this evening. My question is a follow up on that to the council members. Are you considering a specific program? Is there an ordinance that's under review? And is there a vote that's likely to happen in the next few months? We haven't made any decisions yet. Any decisions that are made by borough council will be from uh, responses we receive from our residents. This is being, can you hear me? No. <laughs> They're not. Coming yeah, so, no, sorry. Oh, it is. Okay, thank you. Council has not made any decision. Can you hear me? Don't keep pushing. I think that turned it off. Okay, now can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry about that. The borough itself has, council has not made any decisions. Based on feedback we get from our residents, uh, additionally, studying the cost, we're now in the process of looking for next year's budget. This is an cheap endeavor. And if we spend a lot of money on this, 30, 40, 50,000, then there's going to be other things that residents might not have that they're currently enjoying. We have to take all of that into account. We have made no decisions yet after tonight. Uh, we'll certainly start talking about it more and looking to see if we can actually do this program based on the limitations of uh, size and a proximity to people's homes. Okay, one more question, please. Yes? Is a comment. I mean, thirty three thousand dollars is like the money, but you count the vegetation they eat, the time we spend cleaning the poop out of our yard. Uh, is it you know, possible disease and car damage? It seems it seems that it's a thing. Thank you. We have to do it for a number of years. So this is something I'm going to get into. We have to take a lot of things into consideration. But also, if it's on a council agenda for discussion at a committee meeting. You're welcome to join those meetings and listen to the discussion and upload on the website and some of things. And before any of those things by council, you would have to be able to hear the public and be able to comment. That's it for questions. Thank you, everyone. Is that it? Can I end you? Yeah. Thank you. And for all. Yep.